Um, I hope you can all see me now. My name's Pat. I'm one of the um, academic liaison librarians working at the library. Well, I mean, working for the library at the moment, we're all working from home. So um, I'm going to be taking you through this session um, on EndNote. So this is the working with EndNote advanced session. Um, I think we've got um, close to the number of people who are going to be tuning in. Um, and obviously the session is going to be recorded, but we've also got a recording already online. So it's unlikely we'll actually post this one because we've got a pretty good recording already um, available at the um, library subject guide. So just while um, the last few people are coming in, I'll just show you a couple of the EndNote resources that, oh, and I should also introduce down in the um, chat window um, for in Zoom. If you do have any questions during this session, you can ask those questions in the chat window and my colleague Emma is gonna be there. So if I miss any of your questions, Emma will answer them for you on the way through, but I'll also take care of some of those questions on the way through as well. So, um, and Emma's waving in the um, Zoom window there as well. So, um, how are we doing? We've got 14 people in. We might just give it another minute for a few more people to arrive. But in the meantime, I'm going to just jump over to the library website and show you where you can access, <coughs> where you can access recordings of this session. Um, if you want to review anything on the way through. Um, so underneath the study tab on the library website, we've got our EndNote subject guide. Um, and as experienced users of EndNote, you've probably already seen this guide, but this is where we've got um, set up instructions, um, collecting references, which is really valuable if you're um, looking at some more complicated databases where you might find a struggle to export references from library databases. This is the place to go. Uh, some guide, guidelines around writing and citing, and backup and sync, which is some of the stuff that we'll be looking at today, and then key problems that people experience. We sort of, as queries come in, we aggregate those all into a, a troubleshooting page just there. And if you scroll down on that page, we've also got a recording of our introductory EndNote session and this session that we're about to do today. So if you do want to review at any point, both of those are available for you in the EndNote subject guide. So we're at uh, three minutes past, so might as well get the ball rolling now for the whole um, workshop. So just a bit of Zoom protocol for this session. Um, you can have your video on or off, it's up to you. Uh, the the uni's not as overloaded with um, Zoom video. Uh, the mics, if you can keep them muted when you're not speaking, but if you do wanna ask a question, um, you can raise your hand using the raise your hand function, which you'll find in the participants menu um, in, in your Zoom. Um, so if you hit raise hand, that'll put your hand up and I can come to you. Um, or you can just un unmute and jump over the top if you like. And if you do have any questions, um, you can also type them into the chat box. And that's probably the easiest way to go because it might be that I will address your question on the way through the session or um, there's, <clears throat> there's a quick and simple answer that might um, be best solved by Emma sending a link or something like that on the way through. Um, so an overview of this session, we're gonna look at collecting references. So a few more advanced uh, collecting references approaches. Uh, annotating references and using the research notes function, which is a really valuable uh, feature of EndNote that a lot of people don't actually use. We're going to look at how to set up sync and how you might use sync for collaborating with colleagues, particularly in research groups and um, with external partners to the university. And also when we're getting ready to submit a thesis or a chapter or a journal article, what are some of the steps that you need to take before submitting an article? Now, unfortunately, the session is going to be really talky, so I apologize for that. I really like to have as much um, play around with EndNote yourself at your end. So while I'm explaining some of these processes, you can follow along if you've got your own EndNote library, but I think you might find it more valuable to sort of um, watch as we go through and, and I'll demonstrate a few of these features. And then if you have questions at the end of the session, I'm going to hang around for about half an hour after the session finishes so I can help you with any uh, questions that you think are very specific to your own EndNote. Um, so if you're having trouble with something or you want to know about something a bit more, then hang around till the end of the session and I can help you out with that. If you see a slide that has this important thing on it, so an exclamation mark and a big orange box, um, these are important things to remember about some of the features that we're showing you as we go through um, the workshop. So keep an eye out for that one. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about is collecting references. This is only the second time I've delivered this workshop. It's a brand new So if I sort of feel like, oh, what's coming up next? Um, that's, that's why collecting. So collecting references. Um, what we're going to show you is um, adding folders to your library. So I think most people are very familiar by the time they come to, um, at least when we last ran this workshop, people were very familiar with manually adding a reference to your EndNote library and importing a reference from 
one of the library databases. So exporting an RIS file from a library database. But one of the questions that we do get asked quite regularly in the introductory workshop is how can people add folders of PDFs that you may already have on your device to EndNote? And there is an easy way to um, import an existing folder of PDFs. You can do it in one big go. And if those PDFs have got metadata, specifically the, um, the DOI, the digital object identifier, if those PDFs have got that metadata tagged into the document and EndNote is connected to the internet, so you, you've got your you know, Wi-Fi switched on on your device, EndNote is able to import all of the bibliographic data for that particular item. If EndNote can't find that information, it will just import it with the file name only. And I'm gonna demonstrate what that looks like in a moment. Oh, here we go. So let's, um, I'll jump over to uh, my EndNote application. What I might do here is share the entire screen just so that you can see me jumping between applications. And one thing just to be mindful of during this session, of course, is that um, I'm using a Mac here, but most of these functions are going to look exactly the same whether you're using a Mac or a PC, apart from obviously this rubbish down the bottom here where I'm jumping between applications. Um, so if there is a difference, I'll, I'll sort of flag it with you. Um, so what I want to do is go to my EndNote library. So this is um, Pat's EndNote library. I'm just going to stop searching for things. Um, and I'm just going to hide a few controls so I don't see all this uh, Zoom stuff on my screen. And what I want to do is go up to the file menu on um, my, my EndNote application. And I'm going to go down to import. So this is where you can import a whole range of different things to EndNote. And you'll have an options or um, on PCs, you'll see a window like this, where basically you can choose what kind of things you're, hope you're telling EndNote to import. So by default, an EndNote import um, is going to look for things like um, an RIS file, which you download from a, a database, um, or EndNote import, which, which similarly looks for an RIS file. Because I'm going to import a folder, I'm going to tell it that I'm interested in importing a folder of PDF files. Um, and I usually have duplicates switched on because you never know what it's going to import. If, if I've got a big folder of, you know, uh, PDFs that I've collected over the years or something that I want to import into my EndNote library, I just say import everything because deduplication is a really easy process, which I can show you later. So I've um, pre-created a um, EndNote folder on the desktop here um, called working with EndNote. So you can see in here that I've got a number of different uh, files in here. Uh, PDF files in here. So what I'm going to do is select that folder and then click import. <clears throat> and so EndNote's going to do a bit of thinking as it imports those items. And what it's doing is looking at the internet, looking for that digital object identifier, looking for a way to identify the information in that PDF. And it really does vary from database to database, whether or not there's going to be that metadata attached to each file, as you'll notice in a second. So with articles that are quite recent, so things that are from say 2010 forward, that um, metadata is attached. And you can see here that for most of these references, it's actually populated everything that I need into the citation. So I've got here, you know, year, title of the article and so on. But for this one up the top here, um, it hasn't been able to find the necessary metadata. Now that's because for this particular article, it's from a thing called a journal called the Harvard Business Review. Um, Harvard Business Review never tags their, um, their PDFs with a DOI, so we can't identify that metadata. And what EndNote does is simply puts the file name in the title field of this article. So if, I'm, if I end up with a scenario like that, what I need to do is just fill in um, the details for that article. So I need to go and have a look. Um, who was the author of this article? He says as he scrolls all over the screen looking for an author in here somewhere, and I'm probably missing that. Um, you know, let's just pretend that I've, I've written that article uh, and in 2020, and then you just fill out the details accordingly. So remote workers um, really are more productive. There's some uh, exciting news for you during the lockdown. Well, the, slowly ending lockdown. So anyway, there you go. You've, you've named that article um, because uh, EndNote hadn't identified that metadata. So what I do is fill that data in and there you go. EndNote's got everything that I need there. So that's pretty straightforward, um, importing a folder. EndNote also has a function where you can watch a folder of PDFs if you've created one. Um, so the way this works, I'll jump over to EndNote here, from your file menu, uh, sorry, from um, the preferences menu, 
which in um, a Mac is under EndNote X9 and preferences. And on a PC, you'll go to the edit menu and then you go to preferences. And you'll have here, uh, not folder locations, PDF handling. <clears throat> Hey, I might need to change my settings here as well. So by default with PDF um, auto renaming options, I actually have this switched to author, year and title. And what this does is renames PDF files as they're added to your EndNote library so that it has the um, title of the author, the year of the article and, uh, sorry, the name of the author, the year of the article and the title of the article as the PDF file name. And the reason this is a good idea is that it makes it um, cleaner and more manageable in the file structure in EndNote itself. But also sometimes when you download a PDF file from a database, it'll have like percentage signs and, and strange characters. And sometimes these can jam up EndNote if they get added to the file structure, particularly on a PC because it doesn't like some of those characters um, in file names. So renaming files um, is that PDF files is a really good option. And down here, you can actually switch on enable automatic importing. And what that means is um, EndNote will always watch a particular folder on your computer. And anytime you add a PDF to that folder, if this is switched on, EndNote will automatically import that PDF into your EndNote library. So I don't have that switched on on this one because, I mean, I used to use it a fair bit, but these days I prefer to download an RAS file from a database and attach the PDF to it as I'm going. Um, I tend not to download full text until I know that I'm actually going to read a full article. And I think you can find that out by um, reading abstracts and downloading RAS files on the way through. Um, so that's the two automatic import options that EndNote has available to you. Um, accessing, uh, importing a whole folder and importing, um, like watching a watch folder. So I mentioned before, if there's incomplete metadata in the PDF, um, if EndNote can't detect the DOI, it'll add the it'll add the reference to your library, but it'll have the file name in the title field. So then you just need to manually add the details. Situations where you might see this happen quite frequently, um, if you're importing um, uh, cases, so if you're a law student, if you're importing cases, if you're importing grey literature, so um, the kinds of reports that get released by consultancies and think tanks, so something by the Grattan Institute or, or Deloitte or KPMG, um, you'll see that they don't have metadata tagged into those PDFs. So we'll only import the file name in the title field and policy documents and that sort of stuff as well. You'll need to manually add the details for those. But it's not too, it's not too laborious. It's a good way to get those items into your EndNote library so that they are all in the one spot. They're easy for you to cite down the track. You just need to manually add those details to them. Now, one, uh, the reverse of this is if you've got... Um, a journal article in your EndNote library already, so a reference in your EndNote library already, and you want to find the full text of the article. So you need, um, I'm going to jump over here. Now, what you'll notice after you've imported an item to like a PDF into your EndNote library is you have this, um, what is it called? Why am I having mental blank? Paperclip, um, analog thing. Um, this paperclip uh, down, the, down that column there to indicate that a PDF is attached to that item in your EndNote library. So what we can do here is look for what we're just going to do. And this is going to be a really bizarre exercise because I know that a lot of these items already have uh, full text articles attached. So I'm just going to look for, I need to move a few things around on my screen so I can see, um, I can see PDF. I just want to find, yeah, that one looks like it might have, um, it's basically something from a journal. Now the find full text function is built into um, is built into EndNote with the University of Sydney settings in it so that it can, if you right click on an item or if you click an item and then go up to the references menu up the top of the screen and then go down to find full text, we can select that option there. And what it will do is authenticate, although I'm super worried that I'm, I'm, I have a brand new Mac um, and unfortunately um, I feel like yeah, the settings aren't in there. So great. All right, well, you get a double demonstration. Now I'm going to show you how to find the settings for find full text. Um, so normally by default, when you install EndNote from um, the university, you will have these settings automatically included in find full text. Um, and that's the open URL path and the easy proxy for the library. Um, so I'm just going to add those two things in here. 
save that. Uh, you can actually switch on in your preferences a thing called automatically invoke find full text, which means when you import an RAS file into your EndNote library, it automatically searches for the full text so that it can attach it. So that's done now. And if I right click that and go to find full text, great, authenticate is there. So when I select find full text, it'll authenticate using the university's Unikey login. So I'm just going to put in my Unikey. And what that will now do, so if I scroll down to the very bottom here, it starts searching across our databases to see if it can find the full text. Now, this doesn't always work, um, partly to do with the metadata, with the access that we get given through, um, through our different databases. So if the database doesn't, oh, here, let's give this one a go. It's very old from 1990. Um, but if you just be mindful down here, have a look at this find full text option. When I invoke find full text on this, it does that searching function. So it'll look for either a URL that can attach or it'll look for a, um, a full text PDF, which will then attach to the library. I'm, I'm conscious that it's the demonstration is not working very well because um, I've already done this on most of my uh, EndNote library. So if I just see if there is one floating around in here, no, 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 that's how, um, Exciting. I might highlight a few and then we'll just see if we catch a few. Um, and you can actually invoke find full text on a large number of articles. Uh, so if you highlight a few and then select find full text again, it'll start searching for all those articles down the bottom here. So you see searching for 16 progressively as it goes through, if it can't find them, it says not found. If it can find them, he hopes um, it will either attach a URL or attach a full text PDF. So I think um, one of the reasons we don't show find full text in, oh, there we go, found URL, one of those results has come up. So one of the reasons we don't show find full text uh, in the introductory classes is probably about 50 to 60% effective um, for most of the articles that we download. And like I said, that's to do with licensing with our databases. So they aren't all accessible through the um, open URL pathway that makes find full text work. But um, it is a useful thing if you've imported a huge number of references, you can run it across a large um, number of them. Like uh, uh, if you've imported a large number of RS files from a database, you can run find full text, see what kinds of things you can find and attach. Um, and then if need be, you can manually add the PDFs after that to each reference. So you see here I'm finding a number of URLs, which it's attaching, which is cool, which means in those articles um, that it's found. So if I click into this um, found URL field, I can now go into those, there'll be a URL sitting there, which I can click through to um, and access the PDF. And then if I wanted to, I'd just download the PDF and attach it back into this article. Um, so that's the find full text feature. Uh, and of course, like we just mentioned this, when find full text completes, it's worth double checking whether you have a link um, or a PDF file that's attached. And I said, the tool doesn't work all the time due to the licensing. Now, one of the other really cool features of um, EndNote is smart groups. So in our introductory course, we talk about how you create groups of references. So a normal group that you create and group sets, you just click and drag references into that group. Smart groups are a way to automatically create groups of references based on things like dates or keywords, uh, your research notes or anything you've identified like that. Something to remember about smart groups though, is that if you have sync switched on, it won't back up your smart groups to the cloud because they're, um, they're unique to the individual computer and, and the references that are on that computer. Um, to create a smart group, um, this is a really fun part. I've got a number of them in here. Um, so I might just delete that one so that we can see what it looks like um, to create it from scratch. So if I go to um, my groups menu up the top here and I select um, where's group create smart group. I see I've got something highlighted, so I can't do that. So I'll just click up to PhD here and then go to groups. Uh, smart, create smart group up the top here. Um, Louise has just asked a question just regarding the find full text. Um, what do you do if you click a find full text that says item not found? Um, what I would then do is search for that item again in the library database um, and access um, the, the PDF through the library database, like through um, 
your web browser and then download the PDF and attach it to that item. So find full text um, will only work 60% of the time. If you've got a, a reference in your database, in your um, EndNote library here, I might give you a demonstration of what this looks like. Um, let's say we were going with this particular reference here that has nothing attached to it. I could just copy um, the citation there. Um, and then I would jump over to Google Scholar probably and type that citation in and then download the PDF. So it's pretty easy to attach them. Um, but if you've got a very large number of RS files in your database or references without attachments, that's the easiest way to attach them. So what I'm going to do now is create my smart group. So up at the groups menu up the top here, I select create smart group. Um, now I can name that smart group, whatever I want, but I'm going to name this one Harvard business review. And then I'll just delete um, these other rules. So you can set any number of rules to sort of filter out different things. So you can say, look, Harvard Business Review, articles after 2013 or whatever you want. But in this one, and you can obviously filter by author, but basically the filters in smart groups can apply to any field in an EndNote reference, which is what makes it so powerful. Because down here you'll see you've got research notes, which is a field, and I'm gonna show you this in a minute, research notes is a field that's kept completely empty except for things that you put in there. So if you've got particular um, phrases or ways of identifying um, or annotations and ways of identifying journal articles, you can actually put research notes here um, and then the contains operator and input a value in there that will create a smart group automatically out of your research notes. For this one, I'm just going to select the journal title and I'm going to say journal title is um, and then select and then input Harvard Business Review. That's all I'm interested in for this smart, smart group and hit create. And you can see it's found there are 15 items um, in my EndNote library that are from the Harvard Business Review. Now, if I wanted to change the rules of those, uh, that smart group, I can hit edit group and I might be only interested in articles by a particular um, author, so I might say articles in the Harvard Business Review um, by a guy named Michael Porter. So let's set, select Porter there and hit save and that filters that smart group down to four. So the great thing about smart groups is that they'll dynamically update as you add more references to your EndNote library. So you can just import, import, import if you've found like a vast number of um, results in a search strategy and you want to, and you know they're going to be relatively relevant to your searches, but you want to use smart groups to filter those results down to something more manageable that's the way to do it. It's a really cool feature of EndNote. Now let's say you found a whole bunch of duplicates in your library. Um, to do this, I'm gonna to need to make sure I've got some duplicates in my EndNote library. So I'm gonna go and import that folder of, um, I'm gonna import this folder again. And remember with the options here, I said import all for duplicates. So if I select import there, and we'll just run this process just to make sure I've got some duplicates in my EndNote library. Great. I have to clean these out of my library at some point. Um, so now I've got my uh, EndNote library here. To deduplicate, super simple process. Um, up under references, under the references menu at the top of the screen, there's a find duplicates option here. So all I have to do is select that. It'll look through my EndNote library and it says, oh, yeah, I didn't even know this was a duplicate that I had. Um, so it'll look through my EndNote library for any duplicates and then compares them side by side. So I can actually scroll through and have a look at where did this duplicate data come from, what's missing, decide which one I want to keep. So I might look at this one and say, oh, this is now I'm on the spot because I need to decide which of these references I genuinely want to create, keep. Uh, I'm going to go with this one. So I keep this record and then I can go through one by one and remove the record that has less information in it. So I'm going to keep this one and so on. If I want to um, delete en masse a whole bunch because I know I've got heaps of duplicates, I can hit that cancel button and it will take me into the duplicate references window. So I can actually see how many of these references have been added to my library that are duplicates. Um, and then if I click into EndNote, um, I'll be able to click and select all of those and delete the duplicates. So in this instance, I delete these ones here, which don't have a PDF attached to them. So I'm not interested in um, one without a PDF. Whereas these other ones have the paper clip, so I know there's a full text attached there, so I can remove them. So that's deduplicating. Very simple, straightforward process. Really useful after you've been on um, uh, a whole, like a, a bender of downloading a lot of um, uh, articles from a database. So annotating is another function that EndNote has, and this is where it becomes really useful if you have an, 
an iPad or a tablet computer because you can actually use EndNote's um, tablet application. The benefits of annotating, you can manage your notes, highlight articles, do markup. Um, if you're not on campus and you don't have access to printing, this is a really useful thing right now. Um, your notes will be saved on the PDF in EndNote and synced across all of your devices that are using EndNote. And those notes are searchable as well. So what I'll do is um, demonstrate annotating a PDF in the EndNote application itself. So if we jump over to, um, why not? Let's just use this one that we've got here. So when I've got, um, you may have, it may not appear on your screen side by side like this. You might have, um, have it split across uh, the bottom of the screen like that. So you'll have your PDF attached and I can tap this button here, which opens up EndNote to um, an annotation window. So I can read the PDF. And then as I'm scrolling through, I might find, um, you know, this is super interesting. So I'll highlight there and then uh, where's my annotation functions up the top here and select highlight. So that'll create highlighting through the document if I want to highlight particular things that I think are relevant. There's also a note function here, which will attach to that highlight. So if I click that note button there, and I can tap in here. Um, these are Pat's notes. Really banal thing to observe about this sentence. And I'm probably gonna to have to read this article at some point quite seriously and think, oh, why did I put this? So, so you can annotate all the way through an article um, like that, which is a really helpful feature. And then save your changes to that PDF and that will sync when you next trigger a sync, that'll sync to the cloud and you can access that anywhere. But the other really cool thing about those annotations is um, research notes. So down, if you look in your reference window for an, an item in your EndNote library um, and you scroll down, you'll see you've got the abstract and you've got the notes field. Now the notes field is usually kept open for uh, is used by the databases to keep special notes like translations maybe or release dates or whatever the case may be. Underneath that, you've got research notes and this is kept permanently free for you to put your notes in there. So if I find this article really interesting and relevant, I might say, um, so I can put my notes in here or my, what, my thinking about it. And um, I'll give you an example of what this looks like. Um, um, and then I might use things like hashtags, which then become searchable up here later on. So if I find this a really valuable um, thing and I want to use it in my smart group, I can use a hashtag in there because that phrase will then work uh, when I click out of that and then go over to my um, EndNote library proper. If I search for that hashtag, it should in theory be one of the only articles to come up. There we go. So that's the only article that's using that hashtag. So hashtagging in the research note field is really valuable. Um, and then you can also use that to create smart groups, um, which is also obviously very, very valuable. And I just want to see if I've got a more um, expanded version of that. Maybe this one. There should be some research notes in here. Just to give you an example, okay, great. So if I'm taking notes somewhere else, I might run, write out a whole bunch of research notes um, in another document, in one note, in a Word document, even if I'm writing on the article, um, and then paste those notes into EndNote so that they're saved. And then when, they, when I switch on sync, it'll sync all those changes to the cloud, which is pretty cool. So yeah, there's a little bit about that. Research notes, they're searchable by EndNote and they'll sync across devices. So just keep, Keep that field in mind because it's a really useful way to manage all of the research that you're finding on your way through the research process. Um, and as I mentioned, using hashtags, this is not something that um, EndNote's built into it. It's just uh, same as Twitter. It just is a culture that's grown up around it. Um, but you can use hashtags to identify a particular keyword that is quite unique and searchable by, um, you can use that to search within EndNote. Because often if you're using a particular phrase that's um, used regularly in the journal articles that you've got, you'll find a whole lot of stuff. Whereas if you're using the hashtags in your search note field, they'll be um, the articles you get when you do a search for that will be the ones that you've specifically tagged with a hashtag. So it's a really good thing to use. Okay, so syncing, which is the um, big thing we get asked about a lot. Um, and it probably confuses a lot of people as well. Um, how does the actual sync process work? Like when you're using EndNote across a number of different devices, what is it doing when it's actually running this sync function? So what you'll start with um, is an EndNote library on one computer. It could be a desktop, could be a laptop, whatever. So you've got one library um, sitting on the hard drive of a computer that hasn't been synced yet. 
when you sign into sync and I'll show you how to access um, sync preferences in a second. When you sign into sync, what it first does is prompts you to see if you want to merge all of your library into the cloud and then we'll upload all of your EndNote references and PDFs to the cloud. Now through the University of Sydney, you obviously have a license on EndNote and that gives you basically unlimited cloud access. As far as PDFs go, you, the referencing is unlimited, completely unlimited. Um, but because your EndNote software is licensed through the university, you can store as many PDFs as you want in the cloud. Um, then when you sign in on another device, so let's say you want to use either, you know, a computer at, at the university um, or you want to sign into your laptop. So you've got a work computer and your laptop as well. What you do on the second device is create a new empty EndNote library that's stored on the hard drive of that device. And then you go to preferences and sign in with your EndNote account. And what it will do is download all of your references out of the cloud into that empty library on the second device. If you have an EndNote library on both devices, what it will do is merge those two libraries together. Now, if those libraries are identical, what you'll end up with is a, a huge number of duplicates. So the way we recommend people set up sync is identify which library is the closest to the truest library that you've got, sync that one to the cloud, and then just start new empty libraries on every other device that you want to use and sign into your EndNote online account and it will download everything out of the cloud to that. The same goes if you're using EndNote on um, a laptop, uh, like a tablet, or if you're using it on your phone, you can sign in with your account once you've created it on a computer and it will download everything from the cloud onto you, your mobile phone or tablet. Now, um, it's, it's, you can add references to your EndNote library on a, a mobile or a tablet. Very few people do it because it's not that intuitive and, and you wouldn't necessarily be researching that way, but it is possible. So generally what uh, phone and tablet EndNote is good for is reading while you sort of if you were sitting on a bus or a train or something like that, you're wearing a face mask. And, um, so, and then once you finish a session on one of those devices, you can activate the sync and it will push the changes that you've made to the cloud. And then the next time you open up on EndNote on one of the other devices, the sync triggers again and downloads any of those changes. So it's a really cool way of keeping everything in sync across different devices. The process for setting up sync is pretty straightforward. If you haven't done it before, you go to the preferences menu in EndNote, then select sync and then enable sync. Um, if you haven't registered for EndNote online before, you need to follow the prompts. What it'll ask you for is your email address. We recommend you use the university, your university email address. You can always change that later. Um, and you know, if you leave the university, you don't lose access to your EndNote online account. You still use your university email address to log into it, but then you can update your email address with EndNote to your private one if you want. Um, and then after you've finished registering and signing in for sync, you'll be prompted to merge your local and online library. So it'll give you a whole bunch of warnings saying you've never done this before. Are you sure you want to do this? Do you have a backup? Just hit go ahead and merge. As long as you've never done an online sync before, um, you should be right to go ahead. You will know if you have done an online sync before, if when you go to register, it says there's already an account with EndNote, then you should go to um, the my EndNote web website and log into that website to reset your password and just check what's in the cloud. But remember, you're quite safe. The merge function is what you're looking for. It'll give you, like, it'll take your local library and put it in the cloud and anything that's in the cloud, it'll merge into your local library. So you won't lose anything is the important thing to remember there. Um, so when you're setting up sync, um, it does help to go to myendnoteweb.com to see if you already have an account. And if you do, your online library will merge with your current EndNote library. Like I said, it's not the end of the world. Um, EndNote has a trash folder as well. So if anything were to get deleted, everything just goes into the trash. It doesn't get completely deleted. So it's very, very easy to restore. So I'll just quickly show you how you would access those sync functions um, within EndNote if we jump over here. Um, so by default, um, if sync isn't switched on, so see here, I've got a little green tick on my EndNote. Um, that means that my EndNote is syncing to the cloud. Um, and when I click sync status, I'm actually able to see, it will run a, um, a quick authentication. And I'm actually able to see here how many EndNote references are in my local library, how many are in my cloud library. Um, and then I can see they're out of sync. And so I'd need to sync those to match them up. If I want to look at um, the sync settings, the way the registration process that you'll go through if you haven't done this yet, um, for PC, as usual, go to the edit menu and go to preferences. On a Mac, go to the EndNote menu and go to preferences. And then under the sync link here, under the sync tab on the left-hand side, 
Um, if you haven't got details filled out here, you just click enable sync and then sign up and follow the prompts to sign up. And once that's done, hit OK. Um, it'll then put your details in here, hit save. And then once that's all done, you'll trigger this sync here. Um, so by clicking that sync button on um, a Mac, you'll see it telling you authenticating up the top here. On a PC, it'll be down in the bottom right hand corner of the screen where it gives you an update on the progress of the sync. Super straightforward. The most important thing to remember about syncing is that you create a local library. So when you're setting up a new device, it's better to create an empty library and then sign in and run a sync to download everything out of the cloud. Um, and that way you're not going to end up with sort of crazy duplicates and, and multiple libraries where it might get confusing which one is the, the true library when you're starting off. Um, now this is just, uh, this section here is about collaboration. So when people are working with people from outside of the university. So one of the really cool things about having a sync set up is that you can actually share your EndNote library with other people. So to do that, once your sync is um, complete and you've pushed everything into the cloud, you've got this share library button here. This is what it looks like on both EndNote for PC and EndNote for Mac. So if I click share library up the top there, um, it'll bring up a little window that lets me put in um, the email address of anyone I want to share my library with. So I might type in here, Emma, Emma's email. Don't worry, Emma, I'm not actually going to share my gigantic library with you. So you can set read and write permission there, add a little message if you want, and then click invite. And what that will do is send them an email. If they haven't registered for EndNote online, it will ask them to register for EndNote online. And then they click um, OK and enter, and then they can open your shared library. In order to access the shared library, they'll go to the file menu and go to open shared library. And when you click that, it does the authentication again, and you can see any EndNote libraries that have been shared with you. You click that and click open, and you'll have that EndNote library in front of you, the shared library. Um, so there's a few different ways that people might collaborate with each other. And I thought I'd just map out those pathways for you here. Um, the first is when a student is collaborating with a supervisor. So a student might set up their personal EndNote library and sync that to the cloud. And it's really important to remember that you can only ever have one EndNote library synced to your EndNote account. Um, so the student will set up their EndNote library and sync that to the cloud. Um, they'll share the entire EndNote library from the EndNote app or a group from um, EndNote web. So they'll actually click share with like that button that I showed you a second ago. Um, and then when the supervisor opens, uh, they can go to the file menu and hit open shared library. So the supervisor will be able to see the students EndNote library, make changes if they need to, and then close it and they don't deal with it anymore. Super easy and super straightforward. Um, as far as sharing documents goes, um, so for example, a Word document that you're actually working on, um, the easiest thing to do with Word documents, so if you've got a chapter of um, a chapter of your thesis, for example, and you want your supervisor to look over it, the easiest thing to do is just email the document to them. You don't need to um, convert the EndNote citations into unformatted citations. This is a particular function in EndNote. The supervisor can make changes throughout the document and those changes will be recorded in what's called the traveling library inside the document. Generally, it's better for supervisors not to interfere with references. So just to sort of leave um, uh, markup commentary. So leave a comment on the document saying, hey, this reference seems um, incorrect or that something needs to be fixed up here so that you're the only person um, editing references in the EndNote library, but they are still able to see the references even if they don't have your references in their EndNote library. So um, the easiest thing to do is just email the document as is to supervisors. Uh, collaborating with a colleague, um, the process looks much the same. Um, you'll set up and sync your library to the cloud. Generally what happens with colleagues though is that you may not want to share your entire EndNote library with them. You may only be interested in sharing a particular group because you're working on a particular project. To do that, you'll just go to um, my EndNote web and share a group. And I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Um, and then you collaborate, will then go to the file menu and they can open shared library. Now to do that, here we go, I can't see, um, my, I'm just gonna hide these meeting controls so I can get to, Okay, so if we go to my EndNote web, just to give you a quick demo of what this looks like. Sign into my EndNote web. So I've already synced my library to the cloud. You can see here I've got all my references sitting over the side here. 
So what I want to do now is decide, uh, share one of these um, groups that I've created with a collaborator. So I can go to manage my groups under the organize tab. And you see here, I've got manage sharing. So I can actually um, check that box there, select manage sharing and choose a colleague to send that through. So I say, start sharing this group, put in an email address and choose my colleague that I want to send that to. Um, so that's how you would share um, a part of an EndNote library with a collaborator. You don't need to share your full EndNote library, just a certain section of it. Um, the thing to bear in mind, of course, is copyright. Um, remember, remember that sharing your entire library will also share PDFs, um, and these should only be shared with researchers from the same institution. So this is a copyright thing. Um, however, if you go through my EndNote web, it turns out you can actually prevent, the PDFs won't be transferred to collaborators, um, which is kind of cool. So if you are working with someone external to the University of Sydney and you're not sure that they have access to these um, documents, this is me giving the, the official you know, library line. I don't want to be a, um, <laughs> too much of a pirate. Uh, so uh, officially, if you use that online thing, it won't share the PDFs with colleagues from outside of the institution. Um, okay, so I just showed that. Now, collaborating with a research group is something that's happening more and more in the university. So let's say you're in the Charles Perkins Centre and you're part of a particular node that's working on a particular um, research problem. And what you need is for an independent um, EndNote library that you can all edit. So you're not actually editing one person's EndNote library. This often happens with people doing systematic reviews. Um, the, it's probably a good idea to reach out to your academic liaison librarian before starting this process or to help you with this process because it can be a little bit complex. But what you'll need to do is set up a new EndNote library on a different computer um, and create an email, just a Gmail will do for the research group um, and then register for an EndNote online account using that Gmail. So we're creating a new EndNote library, um, different computer that's not got EndNote sync switched on and we're using a research group email address. You'll then sync that to EndNote web and then use EndNote web to invite researchers um, to the group or use that original computer to invite collaborators um, to edit that EndNote library. Um, and then the collaborators are all able to open the library, edit it, and everything should be running fine. This, project, uh, this process is easiest if you're doing it at the very start of a research process or a research project and you've identified, um, and, or, or when you do this project, you've identified all the people that are gonna need to have access to it. Because I do realize a lot of people aren't gonna have like a spare computer lying around. Um, but when the library sites are open, this is another good reason to reach out to um, your academic liaison librarian. If you do need help setting this up, when library sites are up and running again, um, we'll be able to set this sort of thing up on one of the computers in the library as well, because they won't have EndNote sync switched on. So there's um, options for you once um, all the sites are up and running properly, but this is the process for collaborating as a research group on a particular project where you need an independent EndNote library. So the last thing we we're going to talk about today um, was getting ready for submission. Um, and uh, one of the questions that we, keep, uh, that we get asked quite regularly is um, how do we deal with special output styles? So some journals will actually require special uh, changes for their referencing styles. The EndNote subject guide has a whole bunch of these. So by default, most, um, most unique output styles are actually already in EndNote. Um, and I'll show you where you can access those. But if you do think that you need, um, if you need, access to a special style. The writing and citing menu here has some of these amended output styles by journal that we've um, had come up quite regularly and some of the output styles that are used in different parts of the university. For example, Harvard, which is edited in, in a number of different ways. And all you need to do is just open that on your computer and then hit save and EndNote will save that output style to its style folder. The style folder can be found by going to um, the edit menu and then down to output styles. And if you open the style manager, you can see that EndNote has a really huge number of output styles. So referencing styles in a billion versions of APA 6. Um, they've got all those output styles saved into EndNote. Um, if you do want to edit one of those output styles, all you need to do, for, for whatever reason, um, you click edit here. Um, and again, this is one of those situations where we'd probably recommend you reach out to your academic liaison librarian before you start editing output styles because the um, language around it is a little bit confusing um, and the structure of the output styles is like, it's a little bit messy, particularly with things like field substitutions where um, if a particular item isn't found, like, a, like the author name or something like that isn't found, it will substitute in a different, um, a different value. Uh, things like the terms list for journals, so abbreviated journal titles, um, these sorts of things are a little bit more complex. 
So you can edit output styles there, but we recommend you reach out um, just by email to your academic liaison librarian before you edit the output style to check whether or not you need to do that or whether or not an edited style already exists somewhere and you can just install it automatically in your EndNote. Ah, demonstrate that. Um, the last thing that you need to think about before submission is converting your file to plain text. Um, so let's create a Word document down here. Oh, here's one I prepared earlier. Um, so, uh, so if I go up to, um, I'm just going to insert a citation in here, just any old thing. Uh, sure, that will do. So let's say that this is my um, uh, very, <laughs> very, very brief um, journal article that I want to submit somewhere. Now you'll see when I click onto that um, Rollins and Rawali reference there that um, it's connected to EndNote because when I just click into it, I can highlight it. I can go down to edit citation, change the details in that reference. This means that there's still a connection between the Word document and EndNote. Um, this is how it should be all the way through editing. So when you're working on a thesis or a journal article, make sure EndNote is still connected so that if you make changes, um, for example, uh, you think that the name of one of these authors is misspelled, you can go and make that change in EndNote um, and then hit update citations and bibliography and it will fix up every reference to that author in the entire document. When you've got everything in as good a state as it's going to be in, um, what we find often with um, particularly HDR students getting ready for submission, that there are a couple of little errors that we just can't get to disappear, but we're only talking about a handful of errors. Um, the last thing that we want to do is convert it to plain text. So up on the tools menu, so in the EndNote menu in Word, we go to tools and select convert to plain text. What this will do um, is, I will save a backup of this one just to my desktop. Um, so it'll ask you to save a backup. It's really, really important that you have a backup before you convert to plain text. And what that does is creates a copy of that, um, a copy of that document. And you'll see here, if I click here, there's no links to EndNote anymore. So it's completely, um, this is just completely editable text. I can go in there and change things in the reference list. And if I click update citations in bibliography, nothing will change. There's no, there's no um, links to EndNote embedded in that document. What this means is that you're, you're then able to go and um, make edits to the formatting, uh, to fonts and all that sort of stuff in the document. And also to correct those niggly little errors that you can't, um, that you can't adjust. Um, you can make all those changes and EndNote won't override the corrections that you've made next time you, um, next time you open the document. Um, Andrea's asked, should you always do that before submitting an assignment? Yeah, um, generally it's a good idea. It's, it's more super critical um, for um, things like theses where you're going to get hit for that sort of stuff. But for assignments as well, um, you can either do this, but converting to a PDF will obviously strip out the um, EndNote references as well. But just to make sure everything's clean, if you're finding there are some small edits that you need to make at the very end and you can't get EndNote to fix them up for whatever reason, it keeps overriding and putting errors into the document, then you just go to the tools menu and hit convert to plain text. So that's the last step before submission. And that'll create, like I said, um, a text document with no links to EndNote. Um, really important, of course, to create a backup of a document before you convert to plain text because it is irreversible once you do it. So you've created a plain text document. I mean, it will duplicate and nobody is going to duplicate your original document, but just to be safe, please have a backup of the document before you convert to plain text. Okay, so just to recap the things that we've covered in this session, um, we had a look at importing from a, uh, importing a folder and also creating a watch folder and also how to use find full text and how unreliable find full text can be sometimes. Um, we've looked at annotating PDFs and adding research notes into our EndNote library, which will then sync into the cloud. Um, we've looked at setting up sync and backing up to the cloud. So how we can do that and how we can use that to collaborate with people to share an EndNote library or share a group from a library if we're working with someone where we want them just to have access to part of our library. And also how to modify a style if we need to and convert to plain text in preparation for submission. Um, so that covers everything. Are there any questions that people have um, before I, um, I mean, I'm going to lurk here for a while, but uh, any questions that people have got before we wrap up the session? Uh, we've got a hand raised. Go, you can um, unmute screen if you'd like or. Um... Yeah, Pat, um, I just had a question um, about, um, so if you have the same author, that's um, published work and even though it's in different years, 
Um, so I noticed EndNote wants to save it um, for the in-text citation as surname and first initial and year. Is, is that right? And it wouldn't let me change that function. Is that right? Uh, so it will depend on the referencing style. Right. That you're using. Okay. Um, so be, by default, for example, with um, APA um, or Harvard, yes. um, yes. usually what it will do is put like, um, uh, if it's, we, we, did you just say it's putting their initial? Yeah, because ah, okay. I, I think it's to differentiate it from yeah. um, the same author's published another another article. So if it's if if it's the same author, yes. if it's the same author, what it means is that in your EndNote library. So I'll give you an example. Everyone can still see my screen, right? Mm, mm. Okay. So um, where's my my boy? Actually, I just remembered what it was. It, it actually was sorry. It was actually um the same surname but a different author. It was a coincidental. Yeah. So if you've got if you've got same surname different author. Yes. Um, yes. If you've got same surname different author, what it will do is um, find that. Uh, hang on a second. I'm going to give you an example here. Stephen Paul. Yes. So same surname different author. The way yes. it will differentiate those is by yes. using the initial. Yes. Um, but sometimes you'll be like, wait a minute. This is the same author, mm. but um, but it's giving me the initial. Why is that? And it might be, for example, with Stephen Ball. If I were to have Stephen Ball here and Stephen J Ball here, EndNote yes. thinks that's two different people. Right. So you need to make sure in your library that it's the same name all the way through if you're dealing with the same author. Yes, okay. Okay? Okay, thank you. No worries. Um, Fahad, we've got a question here. I face an issue in terms of in-text citation as appears a letter before the surname of the author. So usually if it's putting in um, strange letters, so um, which I think is the question that we just had as well, if it's putting an initial in, it means that you've got inconsistent naming around that author. Um, so for example, the example I gave here is Stephen Ball. So what you need to do is check your EndNote library. And if you see that that author in one reference, you've got his middle initial, but in another reference, you don't, you need to make sure you've got consistent naming throughout for that one author. Um, if you've got two authors in the article that have the same surname, um, that is, it depends on the referencing style, but for example, with APA, that's how the APA style disambiguates um, the authors. So it's worth having a look at um, the conventions around the referencing style that you're using. And of course, if in doubt, reach out to your academic liaison librarian. But um, it does depend on the referencing style that you're using. But the first thing, if you know it's the same author and it shouldn't be putting the initial in there, check your EndNote library. Um, more, more likely there is going to be, um, more than likely there's going to be an initial in some of the names and not all of them. Um, uh, Margaret's asked, um, uh, she has a new laptop and trying to save a citation in EndNote, but it needs a default app, um, which I can't find. Is there a trick here? So if you're trying to, um, is, um, Margaret, is your laptop a, a Mac or a PC? Uh, PC. PC. Okay. So yep. basically what you need to do, um, if, do you mean you've downloaded, um, like an RAS file that you want to, uh, import sorry, into? it's, it's what, what, what I've done is I've looked in uh, web of science and you know, yep. and it says download. Um, mm -hmm. and then I come up, comes up with the, the little box, the, uh, you know, the box yep. that sort of says download here. And when I go to click on that, it says, no, you need this default app um, in your default apps. And the, you know, it says it's, it's a WOS file, it says. So I don't uh, really yeah. know what to do for that. I've, I've managed to get it for, um, from um, Medline. Most other databases? Yeah, yeah no, but I can't, yeah. And it's pretty straightforward with this one. So I'm just going to jump over to the to Web of Science to show you this one. Um, so basically, whenever we're importing an article um, from a database, we get a whole bunch of different choices. He just searches for Web of Science. Um, he, we get a whole bunch of um, different options for downloading file types that we can download. Um, the two that EndNote will recognize is RIS, which is basically the, the standard for referencing, um, and ENW, which some databases. Now it looks if it's trying to download a WOS file, that's probably Web of Science's proprietary file. Um, yep. All we need to do, so let's say um, uh, coronavirus, uh, like an um, example, obviously, fixated, fixated. Um, so if I select this here and click export, um, and choose EndNote desktop, it's gonna tell it that it's basically looking to create an EndNote style file. And if I hit export, um, it will download, um, what will it go for? CIW, interesting. Um, so generally what you need to do on your computer, um, so if it doesn't recognize the CIW file, um, you just go to your downloads folder where you downloaded the file from Web of Science, right click it and then you're going to go through file associations with a PC. Um, I will post a link to that in the, um, the chat 
window in a second. A guide to setting file associations. But we also have it actually come to think of it because I do get asked this quite a bit. I think I've put it in the EndNote guide now. So let me just quickly have a look. I thought of that at the beginning. I thought, I'll oh, put you it's in there. <laughs> Usually, yeah. I <laughs> had a chance to look. There are still the odd ones that come through. And sometimes when it's a really, really hard question, I go, oh, I don't even know how to express this on uh, on um, the EndNote guide. Yeah, so it's the second one here. That's how regularly it comes up. Um, Fantastic. If it won't recognise it, <clears throat> that link there. Um, so RIS files or ENW or CRW, whatever it is, um, we've got um, a link here to a guide to setting file associations on a computer. Thank you so much. No worries. Um, so are there any other questions people want to ask? Um, and for hard, you've asked um, when you insert a citation uh, for two authors, it appears as et al and should be Smith and Pat. Um, so again, where the way it formats and makes um, citations appear in a document is governed by um, the style that's set on the top of the document. So up, if you're seeing it do, um, et al rather than the names of the authors, um, you just need to change your style um, because EndNote styles are set according to, um, you know, for example, with APA, it's set according to the APA style guide. So if it has author and et al, that's because in the style itself, that's what is required. Now, if it's two authors, obviously it should be displaying um, the, the two authors surnames. Um, so if it's still doing that and you know that there's only two authors in there, then it's either the style itself or you just check the reference in your EndNote library to see how many authors it's currently got listed. Okay, so I think that about covers it. We don't seem to have any more questions. Um, you'll get an email in the next hour that actually has um, a link to feedback on the workshop, which would be really helpful. So anything that you wish we'd covered or anything you'd like us to cover more extensively, let us know. Um, I apologize for not being super interactive, but I do hope it was very helpful for you. And if you have any questions, get in touch with your academic liaison librarian. You can find our details on the library website just by going to meet with a librarian. Um, we're all very friendly. So just flick us an email. Um, so if you click in here, you'll see like business or whatever. Um, flick us an email and get in touch with any questions. All right. Thanks everybody for tuning in.